But thanks, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, join this panel and talk. Um, uh, I, I really wish I was demoing something. It was being released for the first time. Um, I mean, next, next, next time I'm here. Um, so I represent DMDAI. The, uh, it's a long name. It's Digital Manufacturing Design Innovation Institute. Um, uh, we're a public-private partnership of innovative manufacturers and technology providers that are all coming together to basically forge what the future of manufacturing looks like for themselves. Uh, and explore technology areas and go deeper to figure out and de-risk investment um, and advance uh, capabilities quicker. Um, we're a nonprofit uh, and we're part of a, a national network here in the United States called Manufacturing USA. Um, the vast majority of the our, see, our sister institutes are, uh, in my mind, like they're vertical around a process. You know, additive manufacturing, flexible electronics, lightweight composites and metals, uh, and, and a very specific technology area. Um, we're somewhat unique in this landscape in that we're cross-cutting, and it's all around like integrating those systems together into uh, a whole that looks across the entire um, value chain. Okay. Um, so I think what Nesbitt described around the ecosystem of partners is uh, like struck uh, close to home. Um, and so we are, uh, by design, actually an ecosystem of uh, partners. Um, you see here a, a cross-section. We have about 320 partners in, in aggregate. Um, and that represent a whole bunch of different stakeholder groups. Uh, and so we're trying to bring together folks across multiple industries. And if you look, you have a lot of discrete manufacturers that would be, an example, aerospace and defense. And they can sit next to industrial equipment providers um, where they wouldn't necessarily meet in the same uh, like normal circles uh, within their, you know, their communities and exchange information and uh, learnings and talk about use cases in a great deal of depth uh, under the auspices of our uh, membership agreement and NDAs. Um, and to basically make the starting point of those manufacturers, uh, any one starting point, like what they've learned, becomes the new launching off point for anyone else in the network. So it's a way to, to really de-risk and not have to go take the scars of, that someone else has already gotten, like learn from their mistakes and move on. Um, we're also trying to bring together you know, both continuous and discrete manufacturers. And if you look here, we have about 45 universities um, uh, across a variety of uh, sort of national uh, framework. Small manufacturers, over 200 technology providers of various types, um, yeah, all coming together uh, to to collaborate. Basically, is what we, what we do. Um, so this is probably preaching to the choir, given the the, the folks that are actually in this audience. Uh, and either you'll look at it and say, okay, these numbers are too low because I'm, I'm a true believer, or you're going to look at it and maybe you say this actually at the same time, like these numbers are great, but don't show my CEO. Um, uh, this is some work that we did uh, at the end of 2016 uh, with one of our partners, uh, McKinsey, uh, to understand, okay, what is the actual impact of digitalization? Like this, uh, unlike if you look at Six Sigma or Lean, you know, there's a, a wealth of case history in those methodologies. You can look at it and say, we know the companies that employ these tools see this type of performance improvement. You know, digital is more difficult, and I think a lot of the comments throughout the day-to-day um, uh, -day and previous um, you know, workshops kind of highlight the fact that you know, the ROI is sometimes uncertain, uh, and no one's really gone through a full journey. Uh, everyone's at sort of a very nascent point, um, and that nascency may be very, very early, or you may be into it with a, a strategy, but no one's really realized the full potential yet. So this was an effort that we went through with some of our partners to, to build out a view on, okay, what is actually the, the upper limit of the potential here? Um, and we did this by taking a value chain all the way from the design through service of that product out in the, in the environment. In this case, it was a refrigerator compressor, a discrete um, product, um, and said, okay, you know, as a business, I might actually be choosing to optimize my business for a couple different things. I may want to drive the absolute best productivity, the lowest cost. Uh, I may want to accelerate, actually, the speed to market. I mean, I think one of the stats, that when you say you're putting out six products a day, uh, I mean, that's sort of staggering when you really think about it. Um, and if you look at the, the times that may be involved in bringing those products to to market, you know, there's a huge competitive advantage being able to make um, big improvements against that. And oftentimes the, the tools you might apply actually may be the same uh, at the macro level. You know, you may say, okay, there's an AR, VR solution, and what it looks like when I apply it for productivity on a shop floor may look a little bit different than what I do in the design environment. Uh, uh, the the technology is the same, the application is quite a bit different, um, and it's being all applied for a strategic purpose in, inside the business. And so. Um, you know, you could, you could argue about the veracity of the numbers, and, but even if they were double what they actually are, uh, the impact is enormous, right? And the, the potential is there. Uh, and it's exciting. It's also a huge challenge, which I'm sure you guys live through. Um, so what we've been doing as an organization, and I'll get into some specific examples here, uh, you know, across that ecosystem of partners, is trying to bring everyone together to say, 
okay, what is the overarching like thesis for our technology development uh, roadmap? Um, and so we tried to um, create a synopsis, a synopsis of it around like a sort of pithy statement uh, where you'd be able to understand, okay, wh what is the core of the idea? So where we landed as an organization, this is just a um, released in January of this year, um, is this a, a vision for US manufacturing on every part better than the last? And uh, you can really think about this and maybe abstract and say every operation better than the one that came before it. And at the, the heart of that is the idea of uh, learning systems that are actually watching what you're doing in real time, like seeing that kind of data that's being um, coming off of Sandvik uh, equipment as they're building tools, uh, and then being able to take that information, analyze that information, and drive it back so the very next operation, uh, whether that's in the factory floor or if that's actually out in the supply chain, uh, makes a material change. Um, and the systems are constantly evolving and growing. Uh, and working at a pace that you know, human beings would, would struggle to be able to do, uh, particularly given the amount of data feeds that we're talking about. So to, to give you a sense of what that looks like in, um, in a little bit more depth and what we're focused on with our partners this year, um, what you see here are four of our technical thrust areas. You can think about this as at, um, stages across the product lifecycle, uh, all the way from design, systems engineering, the upfront concept of the, of the product, um, through actually creating it, uh, the inbound and outbound supply chains, and a cybersecurity wrapper that sits around it. And we try to create um, like themes of like, what are we really trying to do inside these areas that uh, would materially create impact for our partners and really the broader manufacturing ecosystem as, part as well. Um, so let's highlight a couple of these and I won't spend too much time because I want to be able to get to questions. The, um, so on the, the idea of design, we're very focused on um, the concept of moving manufacturing left. And uh, I was actually out at uh, Microsoft, um, Sam Vick was there uh, last week, and I used sort of a tongue-in-cheek description of uh, like the days of like the paperclip, like Clippy from like the you know, Microsoft Office applications. I'm sure everyone looks back with fondness on that. Um, uh, but like the technology's really moved forward quite a bit. So you can imagine that a, someone is actually creating a product in the design environment. Um, they're doing through the initial concept. You know, if you actually have sitting there in your design environment something that understands your manufacturability of that product, what it's going to actually take to put that into, into production, what the cost of it's going to be, what the experience of the customer is going to have um, when they're actually using it, uh, and it's all there, you can actually start to design out a lot of these um, uh, dead ends earlier, right? And so that's a significant uh, opportunity both to create efficiencies, uh, but as well as improve the, the experience and get the market faster. Um, uh, so we're doing a whole bunch of work around that as a, as a topic area. On the, on the factory floor, you know, we're very focused on integration. I'll give some examples of that in a moment, uh, about trying to take all the streams of digital information and then put it into pragmatic, practical use. And um, I'll describe that in a second. On the supply chain, we focus on two big kind of ideas that we think are gonna be impactful. Um, the first is around supplier interoperability. So right now, like, as you're moving technical data back and forth across the supply chain, there's enormous amounts of transcriptions, data gets lost um, through a variety of you know, I'm moving from one format to another, types of issues. Um, uh, that's hugely wasteful um, and introduces opportunities for error. It certainly slows things down and makes it more costly and doesn't have to really work that way. Um, and so what we're trying to do is enable interoperability across technical uh, platforms, IT platforms, and across organizational boundaries and understanding what's practical in that um, to be able to unlock some of those efficiencies. We're also looking at the actual flow and logistics in the supply chain and thinking about um, you know, AI, machine learning, to be able to deal with those data sets and really like the vision on that is moving from this monthly SNOP process that I'm sure most, most of your organizations uh, go through uh, to something that's constantly running, always on, um, learning from what the operators and the human beings are doing and over time actually automating some of those steps or making recommendations so that you can dramatically accelerate and work with new data sets that were never uh, possible before. Um, and then on the cybersecurity side, um, uh, this one I'm actually personally quite uh, passionate and uh, excited about. Um, there is an enormous uh, need here. Um, this is a great conference where there's so many the subject matter experts that are looking at this topic. Um, you have very complex frameworks, uh, or comprehensive frameworks, better way of saying it, um, that folks like NIST, and I know I saw Keith Stouffer is here, uh, are developing. Um, what is missing is actually pragmatic implementations of those frameworks to say, here's an architecture that you could go to use. Um, large organizations have the resources to be able to deal with that complexity, but the vast majority of manufacturers are not large. And so, uh, you know, what we're trying to work on is with our partners, um, 
taking those frameworks, creating pragmatic, practical implementations and architectures, training materials, so that manufacturers can um, much more simply pick up and say, okay, this is what I have to comply with as a, as a security framework. Uh, here's, here are options and what I can actually go do um, that uh, have been tested, validated. Uh, there's some sort of understanding around like what is actually uh, incremental value add relative to massive amounts of additional investment. So people can make smarter decisions around their return on investment. Um, so that's just an overview of like the technical areas. So let's, let's dive into a couple of examples here. So um, we've been building out uh, our test bed in our, in our building. Um, so we've created end-to-end -end manufacturing processes. There are two, one, the one I'm showing you here, we're calling our future factory platform. Uh, this is the DMDII-led initiative with uh, all of our partners. Uh, we have a, um, a complementary platform that's a partnership that we have with McKinsey around training. Um, they follow similar methodologies or philosophies in that there is a, an end-to-end -end flow. So you're doing some machining, you're doing material handling, uh, you're doing assembly, in this case a discrete manufacturing process where they're building a Stanley Black & Decker DeWalt impact driver uh, and, and quality inspection. Um, and so we took a, an existing real world process from one of our partners that was uh, incredibly generous about contributing and putting some of their IP on display for the world. Um, and we've said, okay, we're gonna make physical manufacturing open source in the same way that software is uh, as, a, as a catalyst to invite uh, innovators to come in and say, well, show us what we can do on a real world manufacturing process. Um, so we launched this uh, last year. We hired our first employee around that effort in uh, late February of uh, 2017. Um, and so what we built out, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. We've taken their process, uh, it's a real world process as I described. Um, we've recreated it, we've stood up a small core team, uh, and then we have been integrating solutions like crazy. Um, but not just for the science experiments, but all around a point where we did a diagnostic of their, of their manufacturing process identified some opportunities that we thought were interesting and said, okay, let's go put in a, a, a backbone here that actually will go after some of those. So, you know, what sits behind this is a, uh, an enterprise um, MES system, happens to be Siemens. We've taken a whole bunch of third-party uh, solutions around AR and VR, projected work instructions. Uh, we're taking real-time data on, employer, uh, on employees that do the manufacturing process. Um, there's a cybersecurity architecture built into this that can be evaluated and tested. Um, we have a whole bunch of different IoT solutions that are incorporated, and that's just on like what I show here on the on the left hand side. All part about this idea of like realizing a digital twin or digital um, a digital thread. On the right hand side, you see here one of our machining cells. Uh, this is a picture that uh, we took last um, Thursday. Uh, so it's under construction. You're seeing something that's in between a V2 and a V3. Um, we have taken a bunch of different uh, technology partners. And we're, built, we're basically machining the nose cone assembly of that impact driver. Um, it's a relatively complex geometry. Uh, you know, we're doing it on this uh, DMG Mori. Uh, we're robotically loading and unloading, which is what we're moving to right now. Uh, and we're also doing laser scanning of that part, right? And so in and of itself, there's a use case around that um, where you can say, okay, I'm looking at the part. I'm able to compare that and said, that this is the part I thought I was gonna make. Here's what I actually built. Uh, did, I, did I achieve what I hope to do? And then I can feed that, that data forward into the manufacturing process on the left-hand side and selectively release tolerances in my machining um, to, because now I have greater control over the process. I can actually do um, you know, matching of, of uh, parts that have slightly looser tolerances and get to the, the same sort of fit and finish. Um, but it, it creates a platform also to do uh, more interesting things. And so um, we're now doing, and uh, yeah, actually now I want to talk to, to you guys. The, uh, we're trying to say, okay, I have all this laser scanning. I'm seeing myself machining this part over and over and over again. I can identify that I'm starting to drift. I'm losing control of my tolerances or perhaps I'm getting some chatter on, on one of the, the tools. Um, how do I then dynamically drive that back for adaptive control of the machine um, to realize that, that kind of full, full loop, um, full circle? Um, so this is the kind of work that we're doing with our partners, and in, in, in this case on our manufacturing floor, and we have about 60 projects beyond this that are kind of happening out across the country for about $90 million of research and development. Um, so this, this is an example of uh, something we're doing on the assembly side. So um, I mentioned that we put in an AR um, solution. In this case, it's projected work instructions. It's literally a Microsoft Connect camera from an Xbox. Uh, a commercial PC and a little bit of software uh, and, a, and a camera projector, a, a projector unit. 
Um, and it's projecting down onto the assembly bench, the work instructions for the operator. And it's guiding them through the assembly steps, right? And so there's a bunch of interesting things about that. Uh, you know, and ways you can take that technology and actually tweak it to fit different use cases, and oftentimes multiple use cases at the same time. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a newbie, I'm a, I'm a temporary employee. I walk up, it actually it projects down video, walks me through the, the work instructions, it understands my quality. And when I achieve some level of proficiency, and now it removes that so I can work at a, at a higher rate of efficiency. And if my quality drops, it can then in, insert that training automatically. Um, so you're basically building the training environment into your actual production environment, um, which, is, which is interesting. The, uh, the other thing it's doing is it, it, as I'm going through, it's, it's projecting down for me. And you know, if I reach for the wrong part, I'm going to put the, um, particularly for like high uh, product mix uh, environments, uh, it'll give me real-time feedback, so I don't do that. So I take out the quality issues I would have had uh, experience in the rework. And it's getting time on every, every step that I take. Right, which is, uh, I think, actually the more interesting thing for us. And so uh, as you're going through and people are doing the operations and they're building these parts within their production flow, it's the equivalent of everything that you do, every step that you're taking, being uh, like you have an industrial engineer out there stop watching. And all that data is now available to you to be able to work with and it's cataloged and captured. Um, and so this is actually some data that we were playing with. Um, and so what you see on the, on the top, and this is just against a DMAIC framework, uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, we were looking at, okay, what is our actual units per hour? What kind of uh, variability are we seeing here in our production? And when you start clicking down into that same data from that same data set um, that we're cataloging in our MES environment, um, you can see that, okay, here's where our variability is the highest. Here's where our bottleneck is. In this case, is in station three, which is in soldering on our, on our process. And then you can click into that and say, okay, now when I look at the actual physical movements, like every single process step, what is the issue and where are we seeing this? And so you, you see here, the, I think the fourth from the left uh, is um, where you're doing like wire lead insertion on one of the units uh, and you see massive amounts of variability. Um, so when we started digging into this, what we identified is that, uh, okay, when you're actually doing that step, there are, it's quite difficult to make these connections. Um, the connectors are not uniformly the same size. The, um, it's, it's basically engineered to be difficult if you think about it that way. And so what we're now doing is taking that information, I mentioned the idea of moving manufacturing left, uh, that environment, that, inf that data is now available to the designer uh, through a lot of the project work we're doing. So they can actually see that issue and then be able to incorporate not just on that product, but then be able to scale it across multiple products within, the, within categories. Um, so you can design that issue out of your, of your future product launches. Um, it also provides the opportunity then for your, um, supervisors, you know, folks on the floor to be able to go in and actually provide additional training and, and do uh, root cause problem solving now. Um, so, the, uh, so this is an example and I think what's interesting is we knew there was variability in the process when we were taking this on uh, and it was one of the things we wanted to go target but we didn't really know where or what was causing it. Um, we actually had a, a, a series of hypotheses around um, uh, there's, you apply a lot of stickers to the unit, uh, the very end step. and. Uh, by, ops, by visual inspection, that was um, highly variable. Um, but when you start looking at the process, you actually see all these, all these other data issues. So I think it's an example of, um, yeah, you make the you make the investment and you put some IoT solutions in place, put some uh, systems in place. It'd be very difficult to build a business case around this because you don't really know. Um, and so there's there's these virtuous benefits around these technologies that I think you see once you've adopted um, that are hard, I think, to fully catalog up front, which is part of the challenge, I think, around this technology space in particular. Um, and I just mentioned this because uh, uh, given the, the subject matter of the, uh, the workshops over the course of this week, I referenced the fact that we're building in a cybersecurity architecture. This is a snapshot of a, an early version of that um, and some of the use cases we're putting in place. Um, yeah, I, I firmly believe that um, you know, cybersecurity is the, it's like the, the, the retarding force to the adoption of, uh, of IoT solutions and sort of a, a lot of the technologies that are available today, um, particularly when we start looking down into the supply chain, because um, it's, it's big, it's scary, your threat surface is constantly evolving and changing, the requirements are complex, it's not really in the wheelhouse of a manufacturer. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get very targeted around like what are the things that are really going to matter for cybersecurity, uh, and we're taking our position as a non-commercial entity uh, that doesn't actually have to produce something and be responsible to shareholders, and we can break our plant uh, as an opportunity. 
uh, to to be able to let people come in and, and basically like break our factory so that our partners don't need to break theirs. Um, and we can vet out solutions uh, through that mechanism. So th that's just a little bit of an overview. I'm, I'm curious if there's any questions or comments. Hopefully that was quick enough. So. Please, go ahead. So your digital twin, uh, you were talking about the digital thread, uh, do you work with uh, QIDOC, that standard for uh, model based enterprise? Yes, yeah, so we have, um, uh, this goes into like that product uh, project catalog or portfolio I described. Um, we're working with a whole bunch of different standards. Um, we're not a standards body per se. What, what our point of view is, uh, we want to go exercise technology and standards and then partner with standards bodies um, to be able to show like the, um, to basically vet them in a real world environment. Uh, and then we partner there around like the further development of standards. Uh, we do have some work in that are more sp specifically focused on standards. Um, QAF is one that we use. Uh, you see this with MT Connect, OPC UA, and a few others. So, yeah. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when you say ones, you mean like specific companies or threats yeah, or, or principles? principles. Yeah, um, we have built out, uh, we have a process in our road mapping around these technical teams, these agile technical teams. <clears throat> We've taken a software development methodology and brought it forward into technology road mapping where they're meeting much more recursively uh, versus these like very static, my roadmap for the next three years is X and it's independent of what's happening in the market. Um, given the, the, the speed at which this technology is working. Uh, and so that's a combination. If, uh, there we, we kind of thought about it from like an ecosystem perspective. And there uh, are great opportunities to be able to like pile onto this. And uh, Amanda Quick over there, who I'll ask to raise her hand, uh, actually uh, on our side like kind of uh, leads that effort. The, uh, um, we have folks from NIST that are participating. We have a lot of our large OEMs, uh, DOD and non now DOD uh, uh, sort of supply chains that have their own unique set of requirements. Um, technology providers. Um, right now we're in the convening stage uh, and we've built out some uh, like starting points and reference uh, work. Uh, we're gonna be making an announcement around this probably in the next month uh, around like a larger sort of like effort, but yeah. Yeah, we can do that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some use an appliance, some want to do it virtually. There's, mm -hmm. there's a question of can they monitor the anomalies inside of the protocols or not? Yeah. You know, how does it mix between the IT and the OT once you get past the gateway? Or can I suggest we take that offline afterwards? Because no, I, yeah. I just need to allocate some understand. more time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go on for quite a while. But I think we have one more question over here. Yeah. I, I'll come grab you after if it's but okay. I think, uh, yeah. And anyone else that's interested in exploring the same topic, yeah. we'd love to just share what we're doing. Frankly, get your feedback too to be able to shape it. So. But yeah. I wanted to allocate some time. Yeah, okay. Dean, okay, switch. Okay. 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 Thank you very much and look forward to connecting with each of you afterwards. Yeah.